Excellent. Welcome everyone who's joining us on Zoom or on Facebook. Happy to have you here. We're gonna be talking about um, herpetology, which is my favorite like word ever, um, which involves <laughs> frogs and snakes and turtles and all the above and so many different things that you can um, that you can observe in nature. So if you're joining us now, we're so happy to have you here. We'll get started in a moment once um, we have a couple more join us on Zoom, and then we'll get started. Um, no, not even joking about the word herpetology. I heard about that word when I was listening to an ologies podcast, the Allie Ward podcast, and changed my life. I'm like, this is the best word ever. I'm going to use it in every sentence I can. <laughs> ah, yes, uh, that's a good that's a good podcast. Uh, yeah. A friend a friend of mine was on there for uh, about toads. What? Oh no! Yeah, the episode called "Totally Priya," uh, Priya Nanjapa. She was on there for and uh, talked to um talked to her about uh toads so that's really good. amazing oh my gosh shout out yeah, to Alan Ford. <laughs> yeah that was a few years ago it was a good it was a good show though that's awesome i'll have to listen to that one I, i'm going from the beginning so i haven't gotten that far <laughs> ah well there's um, a lot there's a lot of ground to cover there so many so many podcasts from that um awesome okay we have quite a few people um in here so i'm gonna go ahead and get us started so uh, welcome. Welcome to SciStarter Live. We have this webinar every week. We're happy to have you here. We start with introductions always, and then we talk through a bit of um, just the um, expectation setting for it being a webinar, um, so you know how to use the tools, and then we'll move from there. So uh, my name is Emma Giles. I'm a program coordinator for SciStarter. I'm also a SciStarter fellow at um, Arizona State University, um, where I'm graduating this this year in May. Woohoo! Um, so looking forward to that. Uh, Roland, would you like to uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. I'm Roland. I'll be posting the links today. And for uh, those who are watching on Facebook, I also posted the link to register to Zoom and to receive the links by email. Excellent. And Trevor, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Trevor. I am the content and program coordinator here at SciStarter. Um, I'm happy to be here today. I'm Zooming in from Ohio. So Excellent. Oh, yeah, we didn't say where we're from. Well, actually, perfect timing for you to say that because just to see that you can uh, make sure that we know how to use our chat function, go ahead and drop a line in the chat saying, hi, I'm so and so from wherever you are. Um, like I'm I have my name is Emma. I'm zooming in from uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So I would be writing that in the chat. Um, if I could see my chat, <laughs> I have it missing right now since I'm sharing my screen. Um, but since it's a webinar, we can use both the chat and the Q&A function. So if you have any questions about Herp Mapper or any um, citizen science specific questions or anything that you think that a lot of people would benefit from, especially, um, those would all go into the Q&A. If you want to share any of your personal experiences with Herp Mapper or citizen science, et cetera, you can drop those in the chat um, and we can discuss them there. And then um, to prove that you know how to use it, that's where we're using our um, chat right now. Awesome. Yeah. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Hi, Erica. Uh, awesome. And remember, you can also change it to um, contacting everyone. So double check that you're sending your chat to everyone instead of just the hosts and panelists, which might help too. Excellent. Cool. Happy to have you all here. Awesome. And then for our last introduction, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, Mike? Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Mike Pingleton, and uh, I uh, live in central Illinois. I uh, am I'm not a biologist, but I uh, hang out with a lot of biologists. And uh, I uh, bring a, a particular set of skills to uh, the Herp Mapper project that we're going to talk to uh, today. And, you know, I did some project management work in my career at the University of Illinois. I'm retired now. And uh, so I, I do a lot of project management and uh, I do a lot of speaking about the project, which is one of the reasons I'm here today. And I'll be speaking yet again next week uh, for the o Ohio Park uh, Partners in Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Group at their meeting next week. So uh, I tend to do a number of uh, presentations every year, talk about uh, talk about Herp Mapper and uh, how, how it works and uh, where we're going and, you know, how you can get, get involved with the project. So. Uh, I've been involved with uh, reptiles and amphibians for uh, most of my life, over 50 years now, and I spent a lot of time uh, out in the field. I just got back from a trip to Madagascar a couple days ago and uh, caught a lovely cold on the plane, and uh, which is one of those occupational hazards of travel. So you know, bear with me if my voice gets a little rough during the, the presentation. Well, we're happy to have you, have you here, especially since you were in 
Madagascar like three days ago. Yeah. Uh, was that related to your work? Uh, no, that was, uh, you know, that was, uh, I've always wanted to go and I had an opportunity to spend a couple weeks there. And uh, so I did. And uh, I, I went uh, about, covered about a third of the island and uh, from uh, the center to the south and uh, saw lots of amphibians and reptiles and about 20 species of chameleons. And so uh, it was uh, one of those uh, chances of a lifetime. Oh my gosh, that sounds awesome. Um, well, I'm excited for you to have come back with that, all that knowledge. Um, so before we get started talking about all those hurt mapper wonderful things, uh, we want to ask a couple questions about our uh, guests or our, excuse me, our attendees here. Um, so we want to know, have you ever done a citizen science project before? Have you ever been involved in one or think you've been involved in one? We'll wait a couple seconds. We usually wait for about 80% of our um of our present people to answer. They're at 60% right now, not too bad, not too shabby. Looks like a lot of us have done citizen science projects before. That's awesome. Good. So close, a couple more people, maybe. <laughs> oh no, I'm getting a lot of responses in the chat. Okay, thank you for uh, joining us on the chat for that one. It should come up as a, a pan or a, a poll. So hopefully it is showing up. And remember, you can also respond with our, um, by hitting everyone instead of just the hosts and panelists. You can talk to everyone about your answers. Um, excellent. Okay, we got about 20, or excuse me, 72% um, of us. That looks like a lot of yeses. Great. Glad to have you all in here. That's awesome. Uh, great. All right. And those of you who have not, or maybe you haven't or have, uh, we're excited to um, see what you do now that you'll know about HurtMapper and how to get involved there too. Uh, next up, we want to know if you've ever been to one of these events before. So is this your first SciStarter Live event? They always happen on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, or have you been to quite a few of them? Wait a couple seconds. We're at seventy percent, seventy-five. Awesome. We're so close to eighty percent. Awesome. Made it to eighty percent or eighty-three percent. Nice. Excellent. Awesome. All right. It looks like we're pretty split. So a bunch of us have, and a bunch of us have not, and then some of us are unsure. Um, that's okay. Great. We're so happy to have you back. And those of you who have not joined us before, we hope this is like the beginning of a wonderful new thing that you can join on Tuesdays. So welcome. Um, and then lastly, we want to know what type of human we're talking to. So are we all aspiring citizen scientists? You're already scientists. Um, citizen scientists, I mean, students, um, parents of aspiring citizen scientists, teachers, educators, librarian or library staff, researchers, board person on the internet, always at least one. We got our one. <laughs> Excellent. All right, we got a bunch of teachers, we got a, a bunch of aspiring citizen scientists. Excellent. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, we're pretty split up. It looks like the majority of us, which is majority being 32% of respondents, by the way, not exactly a majority, but a bunch of us are teachers and educators and troop leaders. So um, welcome aboard <laughs> and welcome to everyone who else, else who's joining us, but we're pretty split across the board, which is pretty cool. Excellent. Well, happy to have you all here. Um, just so we have a good understanding of our baseline for what we're talking about when we say citizen science um, and what we mean by SciStarter, <laughs> um, just to give you a quick introduction. So Citizen science is a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. It's how people can make an impact on issues they care about and help science. So that's not just doing a science project like a uh, baking soda volcano. These are science projects that actually help push science farther um, and help gather data for ongoing science projects and other related things that are actively helping um, change science now and advance science research. So the way we do that at SciStarter is we have um, a website, SciStar.org, that is essentially a giant database of, of online citizen science projects. And they're not all online, I mean, but uh, they're accessible online where you can see what you have to do to be a part of it. Um, we have thousands going in and coming out at all times. 
um, and they've been organized and searchable for you through SciStarter. Um, but we're not only just like a database of citizen science projects. We also work to help encourage citizen scientists to do more and for more people to become citizen scientists. So one of the ways we do that and is step two of becoming um, a citizen science a scientist who's uh, confident and ready to work on more projects is through our training. So if you ever feel like you need that um, extra boost of um, boost of confidence in citizen science, or you want to be certified in something, um, you can do our Foundations of Citizen Science training. Um, that's actually a door opener, a gate opener for uh, several other uh, trainings that you can do as well. And all of these can be are, are, are badged. So once you take the training, you receive a badge, you can put it on your LinkedIn profile or your social media profiles. I have them all on my LinkedIn um, to show off what awesome information you've learned. Um, so it's a great, great way to show off what you've um, what you've accomplished as a citizen scientist. So great many to talk through um, or to take if you are interested in any of them. So uh, now that we've gone through those basics, we're gonna um, turn it over to Mike again to talk about um, Herp Mapper um, and um, I'll let you take it away. Go for it. You know, oh, those are cool badges, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, first of all, I wanna say thank you for inviting me and thank you, Emma. Uh, Roland and Trevor and anyone else who's involved with the putting this all together and getting this out and the, this event out. This is a lot of work and a lot of time and coordination. I appreciate it. And I hope your uh, listening audience uh, appreciates it as well. Uh, so I'm happy to come on here and uh, have the opportunity to talk about a project that I've been involved with since 2013. So uh, 10 years now, uh, a little over 10 years. And uh, We'll uh, uh, just jump right in and talk about uh, what we got to do a little overview of the project and, and uh, maybe introduce uh, people to some unfamiliar concepts. So uh, next slide, please. Okay, so we'll, we'll cover how HeartMapper works and setting up an account and using the mobile app. Uh, and then we'll, uh, but first I have a couple other things to cover. Next slide. Okay, so I need to talk about something called field herping, and some folks out there are familiar with field herping, and other people are not. It's just basically uh, the uh, uh, the act of searching for amphibians and reptiles outdoors in the field. It's a recreational activity, much like bird watching, and you you go out to your park, you go out to your forest, or you go out to your pond, and you look for frogs and lizards and turtles and snakes and uh, and enjoy them. Uh, most of the time, for field herping is a recreational activity. The animals are left where they're found. They're, they, you may, some people handle them. Most people kind of leave them alone. Uh, it's uh, one of the things that amphibians and reptiles give us that, for example, birds really don't is is a tactile experience. So you can uh, you can touch a turtle. Uh, you can hold a frog. Those kind of hard to do with birds unless you have a chicken or a duck. Um, so it, it's a different sort of experience. Um, back when I started it 50 years ago, there were very few of us involved in this and it was uh, a very small crowd, but now, uh, in the past decade or so, it has really exploded much like bird watching and other nature oriented activities have exploded. Uh, there's tens of thousands of people who do this now uh, to varying degrees. Uh, people get involved to take their kids out. It's a big thing now. Lots of the kids are interested in going out to the woods to see frogs and lizards and whatnot. So uh, we get people from all walks of life, which uh, helps me to frame it as a recreational activity because it's it's an activity anyone can enjoy. And uh, of course there's a adventure travel. That's uh, kind of a component of it too. You can, uh, after you uh, visit your local parks and your local forests, you might go to the desert or you might go to Madagascar. So there's opportunities just like birding and other outdoor activities to to see other places on the planet. So. Some very cool elements to it. Uh, next. So um, one, one of the things when you spend a lot of time with other field harpers, and, and this is a nice big crowd of people who are doing a, a survey, a herp survey work in uh, Alabama a number of years ago, uh, is that people want to give back. You know, they don't just want to uh, enjoy herps, amphibians and reptiles, and then, and then go home. Uh, they want to make sure that those animals are protected and, and uh, we understand uh, where they live and where they can, where they uh, need conservation help and things like that. So, so people are, are generally interested in helping and giving back and making sure that we, uh, we have these things to enjoy for, you know, the years to come. Next. 
and that's where Herp Mapper comes in. Uh, this is a, a, a kind of small project, if you will. It's not run by very many people, but we have big goals. Our, our big goal is to aid people who do conservation work and research on herps by adding additional knowledge of where the herps are. Uh, and it's also, uh, the project is also set up so that people can have fun doing it. And the, uh, the, the app that we use for the project is uh, also useful to the, to you. You can keep track of the, your observations and uh, you, you know, make your own field notes and things like that. So it's, uh, it's uh, beneficial to the, uh, everyone. Next slide. So our mission, we all, everybody has a mission statement and ours is just to assist in the conservation and understanding of the world's herpetofauna by collecting and sharing data. Next. So this is uh, launched uh, in September, 2013, and there was about a year of startup before that. We have three main constituents involved with this project. Like I said, it's not very big at this point in time. There's Don Becker, our system developer, guy who writes all the code, the system code, the database administrator, he's a security analyst. He's very good at what he does. Christopher Smith is a, a, a master's, he has a master's in biology, and he does all of our proposal evaluations when we get proposals uh, to use the data from researchers and universities and uh, conservation organizations, he takes care of that. And then my uh, job is sort of to manage some of the project and uh, come out and talk to people. And then I also take care of our species list, our taxonomy. We also have an advisory board, which consists of herpetologists and conservationists from uh, several, several countries. And uh, their job is to help us uh, keep, uh, uh, you know, uh, a straight course. We can run new ideas and new concepts by them, and we can ask them for advice when we want to make changes or have new directions and things like that, or what they see we should do in the future. So it's very handy for us. That way we don't kind of get uh, blindsided by, you know, our own uh, personal goals and things like that. So those guys and girls uh, keep us on track. Next. So that's just the three of us, that uh, three main constituents, uh, Don over uh, in the uh, black uh, uh, raincoat, I mean, in the middle, and then Chris on the end on a very rainy and fun day in March. Next. So uh, this is a global project. We are interested in herpetofauna across the planet. We want to help protect herpetofauna across the planet. And you can see here. Uh, this is a, we call the heat map slide. This is all the records that we have from across the planet. And this is a little old. This slide is actually from December. We are over 400,000 records now. And you can see a lot of the records, a uh, lot of people use this app in the United States. And, uh, but uh, we're, we're very happy that we've, we've gained a lot of traction ac across the planet. And there, uh, we have um, records from many, many, many countries now. So that uh, that's good. Uh, that makes us feel pretty good about the project. So next. So it, it's uh, I'm going to get into the details of it a little bit, but it, it's very simple. We you you collect observational herp data, which is a photo or a sound recording, and you use your phone, or you can create a record using a browser. Uh, but most of the records are made in in the field with your phone. Uh, we create a record from the data that you collect and they're stored in the herp mapper database and then research and conservation organizations can access those records in the database. We call those our data partners. We'll get into that a little bit too. Next. It doesn't cost anything. There's no content, no, no cost to contributors or data partners. It's all a volunteer driven, uh, project. And we have a number of other people who help us in small ways here and there. And uh, we've uh, managed to meet all of our operating costs in terms of running servers and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, that's all covered by grants and donations. Uh, you know, it's not a, a lot of money. It's not a big, big intake of money coming in. Uh, the three of us uh, don't get a salary. Uh, so there's, there's none of that. It's just all volunteer work. Herp love, as they say. And of course, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Next. So uh, talk a little bit about the, how this works. Uh, this, uh, it, it's, like I said, it's all facilitated by an app on your phone. 
And uh, it it's anybody with a phone can download the app and start collecting data. And we have a lot of people, just the general public, field herpers, students, high school students, college students, the data partners themselves, uh, people from all walks of life uh, are engaged in collecting data for us. It's a com uh, certainly a community science project. Uh, one record gets created for every herp observation. And then our users, the app users agree up front to release all the collected data to whoever, whatever partner, data partner re requests it. But you still retain access to any record that you put into the project, which is, as we'll see later, is a, a really cool uh, aspect of this. So next. And in the middle, of course, we have the secure database and servers and account creation, user profiles, all that stuff, stuff that our, our Don Becker takes care of and our documentation, our FAQs and things like that, and then the developers and people who help curate records and things like that. So that's in the middle. And next, the back end is our data partners. These are all the organizations and people who are doing research or conservation work. Uh, could be a state conservation organization, uh, could be something on a federal level, it could be an academic researcher. Um, and uh, we, we have you know, any number of these, and I'll get to that in the next slide, please. Next. So currently we have over 100 partnerships to date, including uh, a number of federal agencies. The Department of Defense is our largest uh, partner in terms of uh, square, square miles. Uh, the Department of Defense manages, and they are actually stewards of uh, more land than any other organization, I think, maybe on the planet. So uh, they're an important partner for us. And we have the Orient Society. They're also one of our data partners as well. Lots of state agencies. Uh, that number is always growing. And we have research projects going on with uh, over, you know, over 50 academic institutions to date. And we have some state atlases going on. And other countries are starting to filter in with some projects, including the uh, uh, Atlas of Living Australia. So that's starting to get a little traction as well. Uh, it's, it's good to, at this point, to, to, to talk about when somebody puts a record in Herp Mapper in the United States, because we have so many partners uh, already using data, chances are very good. As soon as you enter a data, a, a, a record into the database, that record goes into play with some project. Uh, so you're, you're, the records that you collect, the data that you collect doesn't sit there on the shelf waiting for somebody to come along and use it. Chances are somebody is already using that data as soon as you put it in. So that's that's pretty exciting as well. Next. And as I said, uh, you know, the United States is certainly the hotspot. We have more users in the United States than anywhere else, but the rest of the world is starting to catch up. And uh, uh, like I said before, we're pretty happy with, with the way this is going. Next. The users... We have lots of users from all walks of life. We've got about 8,000 active accounts across the globe. Over, I think we're at 405,000 records to date. I don't think we'll hit a half million this year, but I think next year we have a good shot at hitting half a million records. Um, and if, like I said, the users agree to share all the records that they create up front. And the mobile app is used for creating most of the records. Of course, you can also create a record uh, from the website uh, using a browser. Next. We have some very interesting security uh, uh, features for the project. Uh, unlike birds, which fly away when you try to catch them, uh, herps are accessible. And uh, at, because they're accessible, uh, we need to keep localities, their localities hidden so that we don't have people, poachers and other uh, evil, evil types who are going to go out in the field and, and take advantage of the records you, you might put in that we, we lock this down pretty good. Um, a herp mapper user can see all of the details of the records that they put in place, but no one else's records. The general public can only see some basic information. They can see the photo of the animal, uh, but all the specific locality data is blocked from view. And uh, the image files too, we, uh, sometimes image files have locality data built into the, into the metadata, the EXIF data, and we strip all that out as well. So we, we locked this down pretty good to keep, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the bad guys from uh, taking advantage of the project. And of course, every database has administrators. It's just like your credit card. There's always a, 
people who have access to the, to the database, um, you know, with super user privileges and that. But of course, that's uh, for the purpose of working on the project and not really looking, we're not really looking at your records or things like that. And our data partners only have access to the subset of records that pertain to them. So if you're working for California Fishing Game, you don't really have access to herp records uh, uh, collected in uh, in Alabama. So we keep that, all of this stuff com compartmentalized. And uh, no partners would have access to, you know, all herp mapper records. We try to uh, keep keep the, everything within the scope of what their project is. Next. So let's get started with it. Uh, you created an account at herpmapper.org. You get the mobile app from your iOS or Android or Windows store. And then you once you uh, then you can just log into your account on the phone and you're you're basically ready to go. Uh, then you just go out and start looking for some herps. Next. Mobile app looks like this. Um, it uses oops, it uses your phone's native GPS. So uh, you don't have to figure out where you are. Your phone already knows where you are. And it uses your phone's camera or and your phone's sound recorder. Uh, to create a record, it doesn't require cellular, oops. <laughs> it doesn't require cellular or wireless access to create a record. Um, and you can create a record right on the spot. And then later when you have internet access via cellular or wireless, you can upload the records. Next. So there are just three basic requirements to creating a record. And first is a, a photo of the, of the herp, which we call a voucher. Uh, we need a photo to, to show what it is so that the researchers know what they're dealing with. And the location, and, and your phone already automatically handles this. And the, the app goes and gets the GPS information from your phone and puts it into the record. And then what it is, which is sort of uh, not quite as important um, if you don't know what you're what you have, perhaps you have a frog you've never seen before. You don't need to, to stop and try to figure out what it is. You can always just choose uh, the the unknown ID, uh, which is perfectly fine. And then uh, you can look it up later. Or we have a crew of people who go in and check the unknown ID records and and provide identifications for them as well. So next. But uh, I have one recommendation before you even open the app. Let's say you've got this nice looking frog in front of you. Before you open the Herp Mapper app, open your camera on your phone to take a picture. Uh, and, you know, then the frog is free to go. Uh, you, if you try to open Herp Mapper and create a record and then get into the phone aspect of it, the frog might jump away or the turtle might, uh, you know, fall off the log or whatever. So the first thing is just to get a picture. And then you can open the app next. And so uh, uh, one of the big responsibilities is to take a clear picture so that we can uh, positively identify the animal. You can't be too far away. You don't really want to take a blurry picture or you don't really want the focus of the picture to be somebody else uh, next. And of course, uh, you're shooting in a bright sunlight. Maybe you can't even see the animal in the in the photo, so you want to avoid that. Maybe you've got a big camera with you and you took a picture of, it's like in this instance, you took a picture of a toad with your camera. You can also just use the playback on your camera and take a picture of that with your phone and use that. That's perfectly okay. I actually do that uh, once in a while when I'm out in the field. And then uh, of course, you know, just a picture that shows the animal and uh, in a way that it makes it easy to identify like the snake over on the right. That's actually one of the little Cuban ground boas. Uh, from Cuba a few years ago. Next. So uh, you, you've taken a picture with your camera, you open the app, the first page is the, over on the left is the uh, GPS location and it's already filled in by your phone. Uh, it usually takes just a few seconds for it to get down to an accuracy of, oh, 10, 12 meters or so. And then you can hit the continue button there. The middle of, uh, uh, picture shows uh, this is where you select the taxon or try to figure out what the animal is and put an ID in for it. And, can, and of course, if you don't know, you can use the, uh, you can just select the unknown ID right here and you can go 
put in a record later or you or an ID later, or you can have us do that for you. And you'll notice here, there's a list of names down here. And what happens is once you start making records, uh, Herp Mapper will keep a, a pick list for you of your latest 25 records, unique uh, names there. So, so you're taking a nice hike and you're finding uh, multiple toads or multiple turtles of the same type. You, uh, you can use the pick list instead of looking them up every time. So it's very handy. Once you choose unknown ID or you figured out what the animal is, the next page is the what we call the voucher section. That's uh, where you take a picture or choose an image or record audio. And of course, we've already taken a picture. So we'll go and choose image and then it'll go and open up your camera's, uh, 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 what do you call it, camera roll. Uh, and it starts at the bottom. So it'll find your, your picture should come up right away and you can select that picture and then uh, use that. Uh, and then, uh, which you can see now why I ask people to go ahead and take a picture first before you get into the app, because it may, the frog may be gone by the time you've gone this far. You can also record an audio, which is very handy for uh, frogs and toads, especially this time of the year when you get a lot of uh, frog calls going on out there. And you can choose uh, record audio instead, and it will interface with your phone's uh, um, audio recorder. And it'll create a record of the, you know, frog call. You can take, you know, 10 or 15 seconds of some uh, trilling toad or croaking frog and, and save it. And of course, with that too, you can either identify it or you can choose unknown ID. And uh, again, identify it later. Next. A little bit more on the pick list of, of searching for uh, a, an animal. You can search by the common name or the, by the scientific name and um, either way, it's whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, not everybody has, you know, so, uh, scientific names, the background of scientific names, you know, when it comes to amphibians and reptiles, and that's fine. We get that. You can search for a common name. You can, in this case, we've, we've done some searching by a uh, scientific name for the ribbon, uh, ribbon, ribbon snake. And, um, but you could easily just type in ribbon snake under and, uh, went or choose a search by common name and type in ribbon snake. And, the, uh, the name may come up there. It does require uh, some exact, uh, some correct spelling and uh, of course, uh, appropriate caps, uh, capitals for like ribbon and snake and things like that. So next. Next page is some additional information. Uh, you can choose the age of the animal if you like, whether it's an adult or a juvenile or larvae or an egg. If you find a, a salamander egg mass, you can choose a egg as an age group. Um, you may find, maybe you found a toad squashed on the road. You can choose a deceased for that. You're also able to add public notes, uh, as I've done here, the observed during field survey. You can add private notes as well, which can't be seen by the general public. We also have this option down here called hide this record from the public. And uh, that, that uh, is very handy for sensitive species, such as this uh, little uh, North American bog turtle over here on the left, which is one of the rarest turtles in, in the United States and in a lot of trouble. And there's a lot of collecting pressure on this animal from poachers. So uh, you can hide the record from public and nobody even knows that you've created a record for this animal, except you and any uh, researchers that might uh, use the data. Then you hit continue and next slide. You're just about ready to, to create a record. You, you can come up with a review page and it tells you the name you've chosen and location and you, you know all the different data that you've already uh, added to it. And then you save the record. And then the record shows up in what's called pending records, which is on the front page of the app. And you can develop a, a list of pending records. And uh, when you get back to where you have cellular access, uh, or uh, wireless access, you can upload those records to the database by choosing sync records. And uh, then it'll zero out your pending records. I came back from, I didn't have very good internet access in Madagascar. So I came back from Madagascar with, I think, 293 pending records. And so uh, it took me about uh, almost 15 minutes for those records, excuse me, <laughs> it took me about 15 minutes for those records to upload to the database, but uh, upload they did. 
Also, when records are in a pending state, you can go in and click on it and open the record and edit it. Say you you go, oh, well, uh, yeah, I guess that was a bull snake. I can go in and click on, on the record and uh, uh, fix that. Or maybe you want to decide you want to save the record or add a note or, or mark it as uh, hidden or something. You can do that before you upload to the database. And of course, after you upload to the database, you can also uh, edit records later. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Next. So after you've synced all your records, they're added to the database and they're now partially visible at herpmapper.org. You can go to herpmapper.org and log in and see all your records in your profile. And those records are now available for researchers to use and your pending records on your app is now zeroed out. Next. This is sort of a screenshot of the, a website which has lots going on on it. Uh, herpmapper.org and uh, keeps uh, has some records of how many total records, how many records of the last 30 days and things like that. And of course, there's our heat map down in the lower right. And then we have the ability to highlight certain records like on the left there. Next. On the bottom of the herpmapper.org page is also this rolling list. It's called recent records. And uh, it's, you know, uh, it's just a, a rolling record of what people are or records people are creating across the planet. Now, on this particular day, somebody created a record in Australia for a bearded dragon, and uh, somebody also created some records for cotton mouse in Georgia. So you can also just kind of uh, go and see what other people are up to. And of course, you can look at these records, but you you know can't see any specific data. You you can't see the locality uh, because they're not your records. So. You can see that they're the country they're made in and, and down to the county level. And you can look, take a look at, a, you know, some of the cool pictures, but uh, you really can't see anything else other than the, 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 this limited set of data. And you can see the date too. Excuse me for a moment. Sorry, folks, I have a little bit of a cold. Next. So you can log in on the website and look at your records. There's a number of things you can do. You can uh, search through your records. You can add a new record. You can look, like I said, you can look at all, all the records, uh, your account settings and your profile are there. You can change your password and all that good stuff. Next. And one of the things that you have is the uh, my records uh, uh, section, which shows all of your records, starting with your latest one. But it also has this really neat search op or, or search fields here in the white, and you can uh, go in there and search for uh, different species or you or taxon, if you will. You can search by country, uh, by country and by county. You can search by date, and you can sort them. So you can do all kinds of cool things here to, to check on your records. And in this one, I've actually done a little search on Greece, and then I sort it by date, and then I see. A few of the records that I found of the tortoises I found in Greece uh, last year. Next. Uh, other things uh, on the page, you, you also have uh, your most re recent records are listed. The most recorded species that you have are listed. And you get your own private heat map over here on the left of the places you've searched. And then there are some badges down below, which I'll get into. Next. I just wanted to pause really fast. I use oh, sure. it for all of my decorating. I love your bio. Oh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> a very yeah. worthwhile pause. Just <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That, that'll that'll hit a certain demographic, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, there are a few questions coming in, and sure. I was wondering if we could pause uh, for a moment just yeah. to discuss a couple of them. It seems like sure. a couple of our um, attendees are having trouble with their um, Android or Google store. Um, are there updates to the apps coming through anytime soon that are um, that might be potentially what's going on? Um, yes. Uh, so they're, they're having trouble installing. Mm -hmm. or, Interesting. I think yeah, support the app. That might just be like a note for for later. You might want to um, look into that if that's happening. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we definitely want to hear about that and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll provide a, uh, uh, towards the end, I'll provide a, a way to get in touch with us. Excellent. Uh, Cause we, we certainly want to, uh, to, to uh, interface with you and find out what's going on and see if we can't uh, resolve that. So. Excellent. Um, and then there actually, 
Michael Klepp, excellent job adding that in. I was going to ask the exact same or a question about that. We might get this to this later in the presentation. So um, yeah. just a um, heads up about um, safety for the uh, HERP friends. Um, if you have any go-to or resources on like um, preparing for or uh, preparing for any tactile type of activity. So if you're going to touch any of the. Um, yeah, parties. well, that, that's a, a very good um point that I, I really don't have a slide for but yes um you uh obviously uh there we, again we're not bird watching so we're coming into contact or near contact with uh, uh with herps and some of those herps uh, may or may not be um hazardous so uh, obviously it depends on where you live and what kind of herps you have there but uh uh, here's a, you know, up here in, uh, in the middle of the slide is the, uh, you know, a, a coral snake. So this is a coral snake I found in South America. So yes, you have to, uh, you have to take care and you have to kind of know what, what the, uh, venomous snakes in your neighborhood are. You obviously don't want to pick up any snakes that you, you're not, uh, familiar with. So that's always a, a caution. Even if you're not working with Herp Mapper, that's just a great, uh, you, that's just a, a good advice for anyone who's uh, kind of new to field herping and doesn't really, hasn't really uh, uh, built up a lot of experience with these animals. So, yeah, so there's, there's uh, obviously you want to take care with that. And, you know, you don't do, you don't have to handle everything. It, sometimes frogs will let you get fairly close with your phone. You can always zoom in and take a picture of them and turtles are the same way. So it's, it's not like every animal has to be captured or grab you know grabbed or and 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 posed and something like that so uh you have to sort of use your your good judgment and and of course i i do want everybody to remain safe whether they're whether they're just field herping or if they're using the app as well so uh have a care and that's something before you go out is you want to make sure you understand uh what kind of risk you might have in where you live in terms of venomous snakes and also things like uh, crocodilians you know um, big croc, you know, alligators and crocodiles too. You want to be careful around them. So. Absolutely. Do you have any recommendations for where to look for advice on these things or like go-to sources that you usually use? Well, I, I'm kind of an old school guy. I, I have a, I have a book I can plug at the end. <laughs> First sure, of all, yeah. um, if I'll anyone... plug that. If anyone in our attendee list who has like some favorite resources that they use, please go ahead and drop them in the chat and I'll add them to our follow-up email as well. Cause I think that could be, I mean, as a noob myself, I don't, um, I usually get too freaked out to try to touch anything in nature thinking it all is poisonous to me. So if you have yeah. any advice on those things, um, I'm happy to um, look into those things as well. So. Yeah. If you, uh, a lot of, uh, I'm a big fan of field guides too. Um, and there are field guides uh, for many places on the planet for the the uh, what we call the herpetofauna, amphibians and reptiles. Uh, many places have field guides that will help you understand what is found in your area and whether or not it's safe to interact with them or not. And then the United States in particular has lots of field guides uh, that will help you identify uh, things that maybe like a, a, a venomous snake, like a copperhead or a rattlesnake. So there's a lot of resources there in terms of, you know, printed books and not everybody is uh, into books these days. And there's also a lot of state atlases that provide information and things like that. So, um, and then I have a, a book to plug at the end too, uh, that might help people get started. Excellent. I'm excited to hear about it. Um, you can, I, did I stop it too early? I'm sorry. I don't remember. No, that's okay. Uh, you can go one more slide. Yeah. I just wanted to talk a little bit um, about uh, just touch on this. Your most recent records are, are listed. You can kind of go through that and scroll back through it. And uh, the most recorded species uh, that you've uh, entered into the database too. And we can see here that I see a lot of cotton mouse and that's because I live in Illinois and the Southern portion of my state has a nice population of cotton mouse. So I've seen quite a few down there and um, some of the more common uh, amphibians and reptiles from the Midwest are listed in my most recorded species. Next. And we have also badges is something we come up and um, I really want to retool our badges. These are really kind of simple little things that we came up with and are, are about 10 years old now and probably need a refresh and a reboot. But uh, I think maybe we have some better badge making software out there now. But uh, 
anyway, when you sort reach a certain level, like a hundred records, you get a different badge. And so these are sort of things to help, uh, 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 people, you know, stay interested in the project and help them have goals. Well, I want to get my, you know, I want to get my hundredth species badge and that kind of thing. So, uh, so we've added that and that those are all uh, visible in your profile when you log in. Next. Also useful information is we just keep track of your observations for you. How many you have, how many you, how many records you made this year, uh, the total number of species you've seen total number of countries you've been to, that kind of thing. And that's all uh, displayed for you as well. And that's also uh, useful information to, to people. And um, yeah, this is my, this is my uh, profile. And I, you know, I, 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 I am totally dedicated to this project. I probably 98, 99% of every herp I've seen, I've created a record for since 2013 and actually earlier than that. So I don't, I don't just come on and talk about it. I actually do it. Uh, I actually try to get as, you know, uh, as complete uh, a, a number of records as I can for any, any trip I take. So, uh, and I try to get about a thousand records a year if I can. So uh, obviously this is not going to be everyone's experience. And I want to talk a bit, little bit about that later too, because uh, it, you know, it, it, you look at this and you think, wow, that's, you know, that's quite a bit. Um, I don't think I can do that. And that's fine because we, what we also need are people who can put in, 10 or 15 records locally or this year or this month and maybe you know 10 records from their uh, vacation trip or whatever it's all it all it's all important and it all adds up so uh next slide this is just a, a life we also generate a life list for people it's just one of those fun things people can keep track of all the things they see just like burgers have life lists so uh next uh, and I'm not, you know, you, you have access to every record you create. And uh, here I'm going to highlight a, a record I, I just created just uh, a number of days ago on the 16th of, of March for an O'Shaughnessy's Chameleon there. Uh, next slide. And I can open that record up and see a number of things, right? The country, the province, the region, when I created it, um, the name of the species, the dates the GPS coordinates, and then there's a little map here. And you can see that, the, you know, I've actually create, uh, found this uh, chameleon while walking along the uh, road to what's called uh, Ranomathana, one of the big uh, national parks there in Madagascar. So you can see exactly where you found the animal. What, what this does is it, it also allows you to keep track of the things you found. And uh, let's say in three years, you, you're like, well, you know, remember that remember that box turtle with the cool shell pattern i went where was that you can go back find the record and remember exact you know come up with the exact location of where you found that animal so that's these are very handy uh, one of the benefits of putting the records in is you retain the access all of the access to the record and you can uh, use that for your own benefit next slide bottom of the same record you can Add more notes. You can add additional public notes and private notes. Uh, it also lists the the number, the pictures you've taken for that animal. And for this chameleon, I only took one picture. But uh, let's say I had three pictures on my camera that showed the animal and from a different viewpoint. And I can uh, upload those record, those pictures to Herp Mapper and then add them to the record later. Uh, and then save record to update that. Uh, I can also, let's say I, I found two O'Shaughnessy's uh, chameleons, and I, I forgot to make a record for the second one, but I have a picture of it on my phone. I can set up a, an additional record by using copy time and location that basically splits off a brand new record with that same GPS coordinate and the same time. And then I can build a record from that and add it, you know, add my picture from my phone and so on and so forth. And again, uh, I'm not, maybe I'm not sure about the ID on this. Maybe I don't, I'm not sure if this is a uh, O'Shaughnessy's chameleon. I can flag the record uh, for somebody to review it. When you click on the flag flag for review or delete, deletion button, you get a little dialog box and you can add, add a note there. Uh, please, can you check the ID on this? Or let's say you made two, you've forgotten you made two records of the same animal, which happens sometimes. People get excited. You can uh, also flag a record for deletion. It's like, well, I want to, I already have a record of this. This is the second record. Please delete this record. 
and then I've also X'd out Hound here, delete record because that that only shows up on on uh, <laughs> for me because I'm an admin, so it, it doesn't uh, delete record won't show up uh, for the general public, and there's a good reason for that because that's just another security measure. Um, you know, we don't want somebody getting into your account and deleting all your records, so you have to uh, ask us to, to delete your records for you. Next. So kind of gone through the overview of the app and and uh, how to use it and so on and so forth. And one of the things I get from people is, you know, I, you know, I, I really don't know why. I mean, all I see around my neighborhood are these brown lizards, you know, there's, they don't, you know, they're not, you know, cool, like the, the blue collared lizard over here. Um, so, you know, do I really need to make records for these? And uh, we have some, you know, uh, we have common response to this, uh, because those, those little brown records in your neighborhood are also very important. Next slide. They're important because it allows me to highlight a, a, a concept that maybe some of you are already familiar with, and that is the concept of keeping common species common. And one of the ways we do that is by recording where common species are right now. This is really important for conservation plans. Um, for especially you know, if I if I keep it on a United States level, most states have uh, conservation plans, and then the people who manage various part portions of land in those states also have conservation plans for the land that they manage. So if we know where the frogs are at in the pond at the end of your street, or the salamanders that are in the park that you go to with your dog. If we know about them, if the land managers know about them, then they can make sure that those things are inclu included in their conservation plans so that we, you know, that the, the pond is taken care of, the land around the pond is taken care of to make sure that those animals uh, that, that exist there now will exist there in the future. So, so this is, it's very important for us to have just anything and everything that you encounter in the database because it helps us establish this baseline of what species we have and where they live right now. Next slide. I also uh, talk to people a lot and they say, well, you know, I already use, I use iNaturalist and, you know, I really don't really think I have time to get and do something else. And then, you know, I'm very happy that you're using iNaturalist. I think that's, that's great. Next slide. And I, I commend you for that. Uh, but you can also, people don't know this, you can also import your herp records from my naturalist in the herp mapper. So you can get, you know, you can double your contribution, uh, more bang for your buck. All And so whatever the records are being used for in iNaturalist, they're probably being used by a whole different set of, of uh, data partners in herp mapper. So uh, you can easily get your records transferred are not transferred. You can get your records copied over into Herp Mapper as long as they've got a photo and and a uh, uh, GPS coordinates. They can come on over and live with Herp Mapper as well. <laughs> and uh, that's easy to do. You just drop it in, email to info at herpmapper.org, and our database coordinator Don Becker will get in touch with you and help you to get those records over. So that's a, a very cool uh, tool to. Uh, uh, you know, not only support the work you do in iNaturalist, but help you, help you to, you know, amplify that a little bit as well. Next slide. So we, we kind of have some philosophies that we try to keep uh, attached to the project. We want to make sure it's a fun project for folks, especially since we have a lot of uh, students that use it. We have uh, uh, high school students, middle school students, college age uh, kids uh, um, and adults that use the project. So we want to make it fun for, you know, multiple age groups and we want to make it useful, useful to them, which is why we allow you to have access to your records and keep track of what you have and give you badges and things like that. And then we also try to report on our results and successes as we go along. And uh, another thing is for us to be present in the project and that's to be, you know, to be available to help people with problems they're having and to you know, give them technical assistance when necessary. And you know, also to help uh, when people find something cool or to reach a certain level, a badge level or whatever, we wanna celebrate that and, and uh, highlight what they're doing. And then uh, I also learned to sort of evangelize with a light touch. I don't try to uh, 
you, you know, you can't hammer people too hard with a, a brand new project. You have to make it available and talk about it, but uh, it, things go much better if you just kind of uh, understand that people are busy and they don't always have time to, uh, to engage in a project, especially the level that I'm, I'm uh, engaged in it. Next slide. One of the ways we try to be present is we have a uh, heart mapper community group on Facebook, just a, a public group. And then we communicate with our users and they communicate with us. And uh, there's a lot of cross pollination on there as well. Uh, next. I always like this slide because it shows some what I call cross pollination. We've got somebody asking about incorporating heart mapper into a high school environmental science class, which has happened a number of times. Uh, 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 over the years. And then uh, we have one of our, um, our power users, Vanessa Lane, who uses it in her college level course. And so these two uh, got together and, and had some good discussions about how to set this up. And so that those, those kind of things make me happy too, because uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, other people sharing their experiences and helping uh, get getting more kids and more uh, students involved in the process. Next slide. Um, we have some future improvements for the project. Um, I think uh, one of the things we want to do is show the people who actually uses their data. And so we're in the middle of trying to, to uh, uh, write some programming that will allow us to share that with people. And then we're also, uh, I am in the middle of uh, tabulating and, and gathering together all the scientific publications that have used HerpMapper, which is starting to starting to get some traction there and starting to get a, a pretty good list of, of that as well. So we want to make sure that people understand what their data is being used for. And then we want to develop some how-to videos and things like that to get new users started and develop better ways to uh, gauge the impact we're having in research and conservation. And of course, we always are working to secure sustainable grants, uh, like many projects, just to keep the work uh, moving forward. Next slide. No, oh, so the, we had just one email contact and it's info at hurtmapper.org. And uh, any questions you have, you can uh, send that, send an email here uh, and uh, we can help you with, uh, if you can't get, having trouble getting the app installed or if something's not working, uh, we can help you with that. It's also uh, sometimes um, Android or iOS will change some of their, internal code, which might break a feature in HerpMapper. This is also a way for people to report problems like, hey, I, you know, this thing used to work, but I can't get it to work anymore. And that's sometimes that's how we find out that Apple has changed their code and in, in their newest uh, 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 release. So uh, th this is the one place you can help. You can help uh, any kind of question you have with it. Uh, we will be glad to answer your questions. Just info at herpmapper.org. Next slide. Uh, the shameless plug time. Uh, first of all, I, uh, along with everything else I do, I do a herpetology podcast uh, called So Much Pingle. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, right now I have 78 episodes out there. Uh, and I interview people from all aspects of herpetology. I interview a lot of scientists. Uh, I interview conservation people. And I interview people who are engaged in field herping. So... I try to hit, I don't really work with, with uh, captive people who work with captive animals or anything like that. Strictly, uh, you know, uh, things in the field, animals uh, concerning itself with uh, our, our, our wild herpetofauna. Also, I want to plug the Field Herping Guide, which is a, a book that I uh, co-wrote with uh, Professor Joshua Holbrook. Uh, came out uh, in 2019, uh, just in time for COVID. Uh, but this is a, a book we put together for a how-to guide. There's, there hadn't been any kind of how-to guide to get involved in field herping. So we put this book out and uh, basically wrote a how-to with the from the perspective of a, a parent with a child who needs to get, you know, the child wants to go look at frogs or turtles or whatever, and the parent doesn't have any information on how to do that. So this book is for that and it's for the uh, precocious child who's way ahead of the game here with uh, uh wants to you know expand their uh, their ability to find amphibians and reptiles just anybody interested in the field who's coming from 
uh you know zero on this so uh and it's a <coughs> excuse me it's a, a um available on amazon so uh next <laughs> oh that's my yeah here's a chameleon from madagascar and uh i want to say oh. thanks for uh listening to me and of course um, happy to answer any questions Awesome. We have very exact timing. We are at the hour. Um, I Someone asked just recently, so I'll just uh, have it right here for you. If you are interested in adding this into your SciStarter group or, or project list, um, all you have to do is go to the SciStarter.org slash HerpMapper site. That's the project page. Um, and if you hit visit, it'll take you to the project's website. Um, as long as you sign up with the same email address um, as the one you use on SciStarter and you hit the visit button, which will add it to your list of um list of projects or like view later or add to list to view later or whatnot um actually roland you wrote the exact wording click visit or save to review later um both of those will add it to your um to your dashboard so if you have the same email address it will start tracking your um your work um through hurt mapper as well so if you are interested in being credited for all your work that is how you do it um this has been incredible and you had so many so many thoughts and there were a couple questions that did happen, although we're at the hour, so anyone who needs to leave, um, they can, and I will only be able to hold it open for the next five or so minutes. But in case we're able to get to some of these quick answers, I know there were questions about uh, um, safeguarding accuracy and integrity of data. Do you have, um, or does HerpMapper use particular methods to make sure that there's um, um, a lot of, it, uh, or to best keep the all data accurate to end? Um, have the best integrity that come through? Uh, I'll try to answer that quickly. I do want to say one thing. I want to say thank you to Ash Friend. Thank you so much uh, for pointing out that you're using postcards from Turtle Island. I appreciate <laughs> that. That makes that's uh, that makes me feel really good. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the things one of the things we can't really do. One of the things we're relying on with Herp Mapper is a picture to prove the identification of the animal. Um, and we, we tend to leave accurate identifications uh, and uh, to the people who use the data, we will let them decide um, in terms of a data integrity. You know, if, if a record, if something is, is doesn't seem right, or it doesn't seem like it's uh, appropriate, they can choose not to use that data. But Otherwise, 405,000 records is a way too much for us to sort of police in terms of integrity. Is this the actual animal? Is this a picture of a bowling ball? That kind of thing. And we do have a lot of people who help us by who go through you know, every day. They might go through and look and see what people are finding across the planet. And sometimes we get people who put in uh, they don't quite get the idea of the app, and they might you know they might take a picture of a bowling ball or a bird or something, and then we have. Our our uh, our volunteers out there who uh, are unsung heroes who will flag that record and say, "Hey, this is this is a bowling ball," uh, and then we'll take and flag that record and take care of it appropriately. But most of the time, we don't have too much of a problem with her. But in terms of you know direct identification, we will let the the people who use the data make decisions on that level. Does that answer the question? Yeah, and I I think just from virtue of you using photos that. Um, that log the GPS coordinates and such like there are ways that are we timestamp a lot of our photos so even if you do obscure that data um, for the public and whatnot that's that's still information that gives you um, accuracy of where you're getting the or where the picture was taken is that accurate yeah um, in terms yeah we we do uh, the app does pull in the date and time when you create the record. But all that data is stripped from any photo, so yeah. the general public cannot see that. And we and then we choose to show them the date, maybe the time I think too, but the date and time. So there is a little bit of data there, but the, as to where the record was, the, uh, it, that's obscured to what we call the county level. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, there's a certain, uh, and I, I don't want to get into the real the weeds with this, <laughs> but uh, there are tiny small counties uh, that. Uh, might give things away in terms of location. So a county level is a, a fairly standard size swatch for us, uh, just so that we don't end up with a, um, providing more information than we need to in places with tiny counties. So. 
Absolutely. Um, well, if there were any more questions, I'll be reviewing the um, chat. So I'll pull out any questions that there might have been that we might have missed. I know there was a question from our Facebook Live guest. So if you're still on Facebook Live, if you'd like to send an email to that info, uh, let me go back. This, this one, info at hurtmapper.org, that would likely be the best way to get an answer, considering I'm just not sure how to contact you after this. Um, but um, we can also reach out via Facebook, I believe, to um, to check in with you. Um, but if yeah. there are any questions mm -hmm. that we missed, um, I'll submit them to Mike here and see if we can get some answers for the uh, follow-up email that you'll all receive tomorrow with the recording um, and any other um, resources we mentioned today. Um, thank you all for staying after if you're still on here. Um, there's quite a few of you actually still on here, which is awesome. Um, just as a heads up, if you're uh, if you want to join us again next week, we have another one. Um, for the introduction to do NASA Science Live, which is a really unique opportunity because this is um, moving into the next two years, we're going to have some really amazing events through um, with NASA. Um, and it's an opportunity for you to share what your thoughts are on um, how to make it the best version of events or best set of events ever. So if you want to join us next week, we're looking for a lot of a lot of input from our um, viewers. So we look forward to that. And if you ever want to look at what we're doing next, you can go to our blog, um, blog.scistarter.org. And the next or the first one always, the one that's pinned, is our SciStarter Live um, event. So um, we will have that available to you. Um, it is Citizen Science Month starting on April 1st, which is this weekend. So get ready. So, so many events. Um, and apparently it's salamander season. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So get ready to take some pictures of salamanders um, and any other things. If you use other apps or different projects through um, forces and science, um, now is the time. It's our excuse to celebrate. So uh, make it cool <laughs> to get out there <laughs> and use this month to the best of your ability. Um, we have all those resources too on citizenscienceMonth.org and a ton of events that you might be able to be um, a part of. So please go ahead and use that. We also have, of course, our many, many resources that are available to you. If you did register and you're in our Zoom, that means you did register. Um, you'll get all of these resources sent to you. And this is in the, um, the PowerPoint PDF that I will send you as well. So, um, so many resources, so many things to do. Um, thank you so much, Mike, for coming on and um, still being here, even though you're a little under the weather. I feel your pain. <laughs> Coughing up a lung <laughs> over here too. <laughs> so um, thank you so much for being here. We learned so much from all the things about herpetology. And <laughs> thank you for having me. And thank you everyone for, for watching. Awesome. All right. We're going to go ahead and close that webinar. So thanks all for joining and we look forward to seeing you next time. Awesome. Oh yeah. And we have a post event survey. Sorry, Roland, I forgot to mention that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, it should, it might pop up after you close out the webinar. So you might get forced into it anyway. <laughs> awesome. Have a wonderful day, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and um, stop our uh, webinar and share. Excellent.